More exciting as we see our first series layout. We got Foe taking on Native Gaming, and wow, what a way to kick off the weekend. My favorite map and game mode combination, Empyrean CTF for Zilla. Anything stick out to you as we take a look at this series layout? And uh, hey, let me just throw one your way. What's your favorite map game mode combination? Uh, honestly, I love like Empyrean CTF. I really like that map, the pit, since it was in Halo 3. Uh, because I grew up with it, obviously. So now seeing it com make a comeback, a little bit more futuristic looking. Some people might not like how it's ambient, but I, I really enjoy it. I really like the power le weapon layout, just the, the spanker, the snipers, the overshield. So it has a lot of room to just really get some power plays out. Uh, just a lot of stuff can happen and the quick halves, you know, that long haul, it is going to be quite uh, the or may maybe our main point of contention where most of the fights will take through and once the spanker spawn, well, we'll switch now to the middle one. So, I mean, Pyrian capture the flag, that's going to be quite the opener. Halo 3 kid, true and true. All right, guys, we got an international competition ready for you. We got international casters as well for Zilla. Welcome to your first time, LVT Halo on land. That's right, I said it, on land. As we get set and get ready to kick off the HCS Season 3. Don't go anywhere, guys. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to get ready for this first matchup between Foe and Native Gaming. And the action will start soon. All right, here we go. We are live. HCS Season 3 has officially kicked off as we take Foe versus Native Gaming, starting off here in an oddball match on the streets. Foe, the young gun, Wudum, the Finnish phenom, the potential superstar in the making on mouse and keyboard as Jimbo takes him under his wing. On the other side, you've got Native Gaming, a return between McWin and Barcode, who tools this time last year got top four from the open bracket. Do they have a repeat here this weekend with APG and Collect added to the squad? Well, a very similar story for Native Gaming from last year, right? They were supposed to start an open bracket. This time they get gifted that pool play spot. But I really feel like everyone's eyes in this match is gonna be from this 17-year-old kid from Finland, Wutum. Mouse and keyboard professional looking to make waves in the scene, and he has dominated in the European scene these last couple months. Really excited to see what this full roster can bring. And I think that's the, the narrative, that's the question for Native Gaming. Will they take advantage of the opportunity to not have to fight through that gauntlet that is the open bracket? Instead, they're starting off their tournament in pool play as Foe starts off with that 30 second head start. Native Gaming cutting into it by a third as they put nine on the clock, but three go down. And that gives ball control and map control back to Foe. Well, Collectible is the only player alive, but he wasn't able to take much space. They're all going to be just uh, trapped over here at the back of PD. And with another two going down, Native Gaming's not going to get anywhere close to this ball anytime soon. And here you see the finished Phenom on mouse and keyboard, utilizing that utility to strong side his way efficiently out of there and survive at 1 HP in a dream. Look at this survivability, not only that does he survive, but he perfectly times his re-engagement to take down his opponent from Native Gaming. That trickles down to another three down for Native Gaming, and control continues for Foe as they double up on that initial 30 seconds. Now, 61 to nine. And the proper Native has been, they, they've been first down so often in these gunfights. Every time they try to make a move forward, you see the kill feed light up for Foe, and well, it's happened once again. Barco being the last player alive, but he's in between everyone, but not mixy enough. In between three players is not going to be a recipe of success. And it's 70 points and counting now for Foe. Oh, here's the newcomer, Chick. Previously with that Quadrant roster, Foe and Quadrant developing a bit of a rivalry in the offseason as Chick changes teams and looks to rise above his former teammates in EU. And that's a question for Foe. Will they claim the top spot in EU as Foe and Chick claim another slay? Chick with that ultimate combination of the Stalker and the Shotgun, able to utilize control at close range and long range. 
as we're seeing a great example of that. And now with a 70 second lead, Garrett, they're just baiting Native Gaming, daring them to take it. Okay, there's no reason for them to speed up at all in this game at this point, right? You just make sure you get your slays, keep as much space between Native Gaming and that ball as possible, and then just play Slayer realistically for the next couple minutes. The ball time will come naturally as long as you're winning these gunfights. Speaking of gunfights, one, it's it's been that last player alive for Native Gaming, and that's Enemy lost the gunfight, a little staggered out in a disadvantageous 1v3, 1v4, but now it's all four down for foe as we see Enemy Native Gaming's ball. best spurt of gameplay here as they look to regain control of the tramp side of the map. It's barcode with it. Prioritize space on the map, right? Make sure there's as much space between your ball player and the rest of these spawners coming up from foe. Force them to play through your gunfights. Ball drop. Native Gaming, accruing 21 seconds here. They've cut this lead into quarters. And they've cut down foe once again. All four go down, and now Native Gaming with a little bit of life and a little bit more ball time. Mighty was able to get two before he went down there, and that's going to give Foe a little bit more space to work with on this B side. They're trying to crack their way through, but Check collects quick flank. Collect on the flank. Nate shot goes out. Chick goes down. He's in another 1v1 on the B side of the map, but he goes down, trades out. A one-to-one, -one, but it's APG rotating that oddball from the C side back to the reset as he resets the oddball. Goes down shortly after. A nice stretch of gameplay from Native Gaming. Have them back in it. They've cut this lead in half, but Foe are in the stretch run, only needing 10 seconds left to win round one. This is an advantage of having a lead so early in the game, right? They don't have to speed up whatsoever. The ball time just comes naturally. Eventually, you're going to win a round of slays. Once you do, get the ball time, put this thing away, and while well, four going down, Native Gaming don't even have a chance, really, to contest this. Uh, maybe if they get this lucky spawn at PD, look how quick Native is to this fight. Wow, look at this. They're getting back in the action quickly as the PD spawns. Work out fortunately for Native Gaming. They take three down for Foe. Mighty's the last player alive. And he goes down shortly after. A little bit staggered. Now McGuinn has the camo, but he goes down. A great grenade from Chick through the shroud screen. Neutralizes the camo as Native Gaming have 51 on the clock, but Foe still needing 10. And Garrett, that's why it's so important to reach that first 30 second threshold. The pace of play has been controlled by Foe, and so too has the lead. But Native Gaming have a little bit of life here. Can they break through on the A side and hold control? They're going to have to take down Wu. This certainly isn't over for Native Gaming. They're so close to this ball, but they need to win slays. Simple as make sure you get through and dominate the kill feed. With that ball being in the middle of the map, Jimbo's going to make some last minute heroics to try to stop anyone from getting close by. And well, he might have just bought enough time. Collect. Look to take that oddball back to the A side of the map after winning that one. But instead, he goes down, and the oddball sits right there at bottom mid. These two teams are going to vie for it. Nobody going to be grabbing the, the ball. Instead, both teams are going to be looking to grab some slays. As Foe gets the better of Native Gaming, barcode last player alive in the cuts. Can he stay alive and just try to dwindle this lead down a little bit? No, he goes down shortly after. But he allows enough time for his team to get back in the mix. As the oddball continues to sit out, now it's back at the reset. Three down for Native Gaming, but the clock is really playing a factor at this point. The neutral time is 18 seconds and only eight more seconds to get this one through. I don't think Native has any chance of getting to this ball in time and foe. Coming out extremely strong, we're seeing Mighty's kill. drop 21 kills. And when you just take a look at that feed through and through, it, it tells a clear story. Foe just has a little bit more firepower. See Mighty's on pace for a 60 bomb. If this one were to go the distance into a round three, Z Mighty's soaring above the rest, but it's Chick who's really not that far behind him with 19 slays. Foe really getting the early jump on in Native Gaming. They rode that early momentum and lead to a round one victory as they have control of this match for now, but the oddball is still at the reset as Native Gaming, this is big for them. They didn't get time on the clock until it felt like Foe had already run away with a little bit, but now Starting off with a little bit of time here, looking for the camo as well, but McQuinn goes down with it. I think McQuinn is a little bit too fast to try to grab onto that camouflage. You knew those spawners were going to be over at bottom C, the timing a little bit off, and you see how detrimental that's been. Three players from Native went down. The ball is going to move into the hands of Foe eventually, but most importantly, all these power weapons are moving into the hands of Foe. Wooden with the Stalker in his hand, but he goes down. An important power weapon at the back of A to potentially control, but... Jimba goes down as well on the cafe side. He's not going to be allowed to pick it up. And that stalker looked like it got reset. So 60 seconds until we see that up again as 
Native Gaming have 15 seconds to their name and having a much better start here in round two. <laughs> we say that, but then three players going down. APG lasts alive, but he has the most important part of the map, right? That ball. He can move it towards his spawners and allow Native to have quicker access off their spawn. PD spawn there for Barcode, but he gets cut down quickly by Z-Mighties as he's already hit 26 slays. 26, 8, and 12 for Z-Mighties. And Garrett, with a stat line like that, you'd assume he had no ball time. He's got the most in the, uh, not in the lobby, but on the side of Foe with 41 seconds it's barcode instead with 53 but my goodness that stat line Talk about Z Mighty, he's really stuffing the stat sheet. Foe's gonna have a really uh, next man up mentality when it comes to their game. What you should notice with them is they don't really have set objective players like some teams do. Notice how many people are getting involved in their uh, in their objective play. It's really gonna be about playing fast, playing efficient, and ensuring that you don't give up any unneeded space or unneeded time to the other team. McWin. Op occupying the perch at top C, looking to gain some high ground control and some more ball time, but two of his teammates go down. That's Barcode and Collect, two down on the side of Foe. It's a 2v2 for now. As Z Mighties looks to control the heaven side of the map. Oddball back down to the reset as Mighties looks to control more of the map and accrue more slays. He's already at 28. Will he hit 40 before this round's over? Gonna be race. I think it's going to be almost a certainty that he's going to be at least dropping 40 in this game. Action on both sides. This ball right beside that PD door. And Native able to get away with it. Three go down for Native Gaming is... Chick looks to grab that oddball in the back of PD, but he goes down shortly after. It's Mighty's with it instead. And Mighty's gonna earn even more ball time. Might have a little bit of an audio issue right now. Yeah, it's audio issue coming from the observers over on the other side. So nothing we can really do about it. We'll turn down the game sound a little bit. Try to make it, you know, hear our velvety voices a little bit more. But when that gets fixed, we'll turn it back up once again, guys. But so far, Native Gaming, they've had this lead, but they really haven't been able to accrue a ton of time. That's because Foe has been really quick at putting Native Gaming three down. Shroud screen goes down at the back of P, uh, PD, and so too does Collect. As three go down for Native Gaming, APG, last player alive, looking to bait some players through for Foe with that shotgun, looking to utilize some close-range combat to maintain his life and earn another slay. Gets the reversal instead. Frequent PD spawns I'm noticing here for Native Gaming. And Foe do a great job to recognize it and start to rotate over to C, but they get cut down and Native Gaming picks out the rotation. Will they pick out the oddball as well? APG in a fight for it. So far, we've seen a lot of this ball just being out in mid open positions. That makes it so you have to play these, uh, these four on four slayers to even try to get towards this ball. The problem with this game plan for Native Gaming is that the second that a team gets away with that ball, they're going to be able to accumulate a ton of time, and you're going to burn a lot of neutral time playing this game, right? So by the time we get towards the end of this game, you're going to see someone have a massive lead, and that that uh, that time going to dissipate just quickly, right? So I, I don't know if I really necessarily like this, uh, this slay battle that Native's been playing. Yeah, you mentioned the clock. Look at that, less than 90 seconds already. And it's continuing to dwindle down. As three go down for Foe, a 40 to 37 rolling for Native Gaming. They're gonna regain the lead here with Collect on the trash side as Native Gaming have life here in round two in a good stretch of time. Yeah, I think this is the first time we've seen Native really have a lot of space between the ball and these spawners that are coming up, but Native, they have not been winning these entry engagements, and it's going to make it a lot harder for them to hold on to this ball. Collect, checking his six. Oh, what a prediction or and or communication there from Native Gaming as Collect stays alive, but eventually goes down to the nice grenade there from Check. Three go down for Native Gaming, and despite that nice stretch of time, Foe have it right back, and they look to flip this lead once again. They need to find the road player, and Mighty's does just that. Gets himself number 33. 
in the game and well you can also see how much pressure foe is applying on the other half of the map away from the ball 54 to 53 one second separates these two teams with one minute left and a camo up at top mid barcode wins that 1v1 and allows apg to get away with camo no garrett how many times have we seen native gaming collect the camo but not earn it and get a chance to use it. I thought Barco did enough right there. He got Absolutely. that massive kill. I, I was going to say that's a big camouflage for them to get back into this game. Instead, a great nade from the side of foe takes him down. And once again, this is where the neutral time is going to play a problem for native gaming, right? Now the leads in the side of foe, they have a good healthy chunk of it. And now 30 seconds. Yeah, you can play Slayer, especially when you've been winning these gunfights. You feel pretty confident playing Slayer in this position. Foe have never been pressed to overextend for ball time. Instead, Native Gaming have been in that position and they find themselves in almost a deja vu scenario. This is exactly where we were in round one where a little bit of a lead, a little bit bigger in round one, but up by more than 10 with less than 10 to go. Native Gaming and only APG alive. That's gonna make it much easier for Foe and Chick to put the finishing touches on a game one victory as desperation reeks in the air. McWin goes down by the trash can and that will do it. Foe, take game one. At 37, 30 fo uh, 34 for two of the players over on foe. What I want to point out for Wu Tem, 20 plus assists in that game. That's not a three round game of oddball, that's yeah. two rounds. I really felt that the, the bandits on that foe roster were very connected at all points in time. They did not let players get away, they were quick to each other's help. A fantastic effort from them. Well, Garrett, this is HCS Season 3, but it's HCS Season 1 of the Bandit Evo. What did you see in that Game 1 that felt different than what we maybe were used to with the Battle Rifle? What kind of differences and what kind of opportunities came up because of the switch from the BR to the DMR? I think we're seeing a huge difference in entry fragging uh, in this game, right? When you have an advantage, so often you're going to be able, if you're executing on your shots and hitting, you can finish players much quickly uh, or quicker than you were with the BR, right? What does this do, right? It, it often makes it so that you can be a little bit more aggressive. You can try to get these players off of spawn and that's what Foe did. They were constantly pushing pressure towards the spawn of native. They were very uh, comfortable of leaving a lot of space between them and the ball because they knew if they got that a first pick, it slows the other team down enough where they're not really gonna be able to put a lot of pressure or get that ball on the ground. In round two, we saw Native was winning the gunfights in the early rounds, but once they started to lose a little bit of that ground, it was really fast for Foe to just pick up that ball, take a lot of space, hold it very far behind them and say, hey, come, come win gunfights. Like you just have to win the gunfights. And well, that just never came to fruition. And I think there in that uh, round one and round two, uh, the totality of game one, Felt like in a CTF where you score first and you force the other team to chase or even a, a score the first hill or get the first maybe 100 seconds in a stronghold. That's what it felt like there for Foe is they were able to manipulate the map. And I think one instance in particular of manipulation, map manipulation that I thought was impressive, Garrett, was when Foe had control of the A tower and they were almost forcing an odd PD spawn over and over again for Native Gaming. And Native Gaming, despite cl uh, spawning close to that oddball, was never really able to take advantage of that spawn point. What do you think that, what do you think leads to that? It was a lot of splitting, right? So it's all about opening up a spawn, but but knowing when the spawners come. So that's having a great sense of timing, oftentimes just keeping that scoreboard up and counting the spawns and then pushing. When you see that first spawner come in, take that space off. Right, we saw that happen over and over again, where they would spawn them over at PD, but then play quickly into that spawner. So then the other two spawners would go spawn over on the C side. Creates a lot of space and a lot of disjointed pushes from the side of Native that they were just never quite able to recover from. A lot of split spawns for Native Gaming and a lot of moments where the last player alive for Native Gaming wasn't able to make that hero play and foe instead. Multiple heroes, multiple, almost 30 plus that we saw. That's a lot of slays for just two what felt like quick rounds. Really did feel like could have potentially seen some 50 bombs there for Foe as they slay out, frag out in game one and take it. As we head to Aquarius TS for game two, it's going to be a G-slide wall of death for that overshield off the start. We saw a couple of changes occur in the offseason, Garrett. What should the fans look forward to most as it relates to those changes on Aqua? 
Oh, you're going to see a lot of people get melt melted on Aqua. That, that's <laughs> yeah. the big difference you're going to see now, right? The, the team shot of the BR before was already sort of a sort of a big deal, but now with the with that bandit having that quicker time to kill, when you get a team shot going and you get like an over shield to be able to push with, you, you'll see three four down and just a snap, right? And that's where I think Vo is going to have a huge advantage in this game. It's just how connected they felt throughout. You can tell that these guys have been getting comfortable with each other, which is surprising because they've had team changes not that long ago. Yeah, this Vo roster really got jumbled up a lot. I, I think uh, Jimbo and Mighties as the staples, and then recently bringing on Wudum, the Finnish phenom on mouse and keyboard. We got to see a little bit of his gameplay in game one, and wow, the support role that he seemed to fill in was quite impressive. and. We talked about some of the changes on Aqua TS with that overshield taking the place of where the heat wave used to spawn or so. Heat wave now bottom mid. You've got the thrust top mid acting as almost like a power web or power up. And it's the battle rifle at the back of each of the spawns where the commando used to spawn. I think that's maybe more so in a CTF. I think absolutely so in Aqua C uh, CTF, but that Aqua TS is still going to provide opportunities for players with the battle rifle to hold lanes, to shoot cross map base to base or even base to P2 or car 2 to help control that mid map location. What are some of your thoughts on how to utilize what's now a utility weapon in the battle rifle on a short range map like Aquarius? Well, it feels like you can use that for the back player, right? So if you give the back player that BR, they have that little bit more of a comfortable range from base to base, from, from tower to tower. And you, you have to change your play style, right? When you pick it up, right? And, and that's what I think um, is gonna make good players great is understanding like, okay, I got this battle rifle now. I just need to be the best teammate in the game, right? That's, that's all you have to do with the battle rifle. It's all about just damage down range. You have a little bit more of a comfortable reticle on those long range gunfights. Do not try to go and take a 1v1. You sit back, you, you are looking for your teammates where they're pushing. You're saying, hey, I can help you from this position. Push here, push there, and get that team shot rolling. A lot of teams have their designated snipers, maybe their designated player to go for overshield. I wonder if players and teams have developed a designated battle rifle player, that long range, almost AR role. What do you, I call, think what do you call a battle rifle player? Like, like John Halo? <laughs> I think we call him Wudum. Because I'm looking, if, if I'm foe, and I'm going to pick one player to make that designated battle rifle, I want I want Wudum on it, on mouse really, and keyboard. I, I'm hard disagreeing with you. All right. Talk me through it. You don't get any aim assist with the battle rifle. You're just he gonna lose that. It. Have you seen him play? I know, he I know he's got a great reticle. Assist. I know. Hey, I know he's got a great shot. But that battle rifle, you abuse the auto aim. That's that's the whole point of it, right? You make sure that that you have that extra auto aim. You're getting those three shots to land. When you are on that mouse and keyboard, right? So often, like a, your second shot's gonna miss, like within the bat within the burst. So you're gonna miss a shot within the burst. That's the average. That's not yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. You know, at the, the, the top of you're it. talking about your diamond right, three right, lobbies again. Getting, Garrett. Come me, on, man. We'll have to pull it. We're gonna have to pull <laughs> Wu Tem in and be like, do you do you think you are? Do you think you're at a disadvantage when you have the BR? That's what we're gonna have to pull him in and see. You know, I, I think uh, eventually we're gonna talk to Wu Tem, right? That's the first thing that we're gonna ask. I, him, I, like, I would love to hear what his thoughts are because I, I think he'd tell you I, on battle uh, on the BR tools. I'm I'm holding yellow or blue. I'm shutting down the push onto P, and then in a nanosecond, I'm swiping over to car side because they think they got the flank, but no, I got mouse and keyboard, and I can quickly switch it. And, and I know it's just nanoseconds, milliseconds that that cross takes to go from left to right, from car side, top car to top pink, but as we saw at the Halo World Championship, it came down to nanoseconds. It came down to zero, zero, zero on the clock, and so I, absol I, I absolutely think there's something to it. And, uh, poses a great question for when these players come in for interviews. Tools, you did an incredible job with those last year. Let's uh, let's tee up that question for Wudum and see what his thoughts are on mouse and keyboard in the BR. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to to hear it from their perspective. The other thing I'm interested in is, like, are we seeing Wutem find success because Wutem's amazing, or is it Wutem maybe having a little bit more success because of meta changes, right? No, because he's always had that skill, right? But now with these meta changes, with the, having the banner rifle, I know he he wasn't playing back in season one, and, and for most of season two he wasn't playing. But I wonder if he if he got that big uh, that big buff, and he's like, okay, with the bandit, like I'm just as good as everyone else. I wonder that too. I I, I have so many questions for Woodham now that you mention it, because it wasn't until the latter part of those 
global open competitions where we got to see Woodham compete as we're excited to see his POV once again as we start off our game two here. And it's gonna be a live fire TS instead, so scratch that on Aqua. As we hop on board with Collect, he goes down. So not before earning two assists and a 4-1 start here for Native. Uh, actually, huge change. If this is on live fire instead of Aquarius, Aquarius won the best maps for foe. Live Fire, yeah. one of the best maps for native gaming. Right. I actually think this is going to be a huge difference in the best of five series if I ever play on Live Fire right now. Yeah, and it's playing out here in the early goings. We saw Foe take the early head start, make uh, native gaming chase a little bit. And now you could argue the, the flip has occurred as APG finally secures that camo. Again, we saw three, four grabs for native gaming in game one on streets with the camo. Never able to secure it. Here we see APG with a little run with it, but he's not able to find much value out of it because of that. Foe have dwindled this lead back down to three, but Native Gaming do a good job to trade out and maintain that one team wipe lead. Now back up to five. Uh, okay, the mouse keyboard player has the sniper, right? This is exactly what you want to see. The other and thing, the Mando. Drop the bandit rifle for the commando. Wow. Very, very interesting uh, setup that Wu-Tem had right there. All right, maybe Wu-Tem knows some things that we don't as he eventually goes down, not before earning two slays. And the sniper rifle possession switches into the hands of the veteran, one of the top 25 Halo players of all time. That's McWen, as he takes to the skies at the top of snipes with one shot left to work with in that snipe. What can he do with it? The thing is, right here, is, uh, he's, a, he's so much further back than his teammates, but he has sniper. What is his teammates doing? They're pushing into the player as a foe, right? And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. You, you want to make play a little bit slower when you get the sniper rifle, force the players to play into that lane. Now that the sniper ammo is out, I want to see them get a little bit more activated. If you're going to make these pushes, get the players off tower, start, start to play forward on the map. Oh, good job by foe there to break through into the tower, take down McWin as two go down for native gaming. And this is now just a two kill game. As we hop on board here with Z-Mighty's use of the plasma pistol. I've been excited to see that on land again here as we see the pew 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 many players vying for the semi-automatic use of the plasma pistol but he's not able to find the finish instead he goes down oh uh, you see the hard part with how, using that noob combo is you have to switch weapons and and keeping your reticle on head position off weapon switch off movement switch can be hard right so even though you break those shields when you come back that native player the, the player on the other side going to keep their reticle steady they're already knowing where they're supposed to be on the on the other side it's a, a little bit harder it's a one kill game. And the first grab of the camo here for Foe is Jimbo. Another veteran looks to put it to good use. Finds a player weak on the wall. Double she is. He kill. takes down Barcode for the double kill. And we now have a tied game 18 all, but not before Native Gaming. Regain it with one. Oh, this position from Native is dangerous. Look at them all the way at back tower. That They're low on the ground. Foe can have a real opportunity to take some much needed space at the middle of the map and, and start to apply pressure. Mighties with the mid-map control, but that goes down shortly after as McWin has another sniper to work with. It's a good job to take down the pushing player through mid, and I think that's the key in this situation is to work players towards the middle of the map, work players into that reticle of McWin, but before he can even get settled at the back of top snipes, he's already got some pressure now with the chance to settle in and hit some shots. Uh, Mick Wynn was playing a, a real dance right there at Tower. Uh, obviously, it's most important that he stays alive on the map, but even though uh, Foe sent a lot of their players to try to take care of him, he's able to dodge every little bit of damage, stays alive, and get some important damage downrange for his team. Collect now with the snipe. Stanchion at that. Good-looking sniper rifle. And a good-looking sniper rifle user is... We've seen Collect pop off plenty of times with it. Native Gaming still clinging to that narrow lead. A no scope there for Collect. Pugilistic with the fist takes down Mighties. As two go down for Foe, two go down for Native Gaming, and it's still just a two kill game. Uh, the former player from that quadrant roster trying to take that mid position, but Native. Smart, right? Don't take the one-on-one -on -one until your teammate's there. They, they go back around the corner. They wait for their teammate to be ready to push, and they both push at the same time. Chick didn't expect it. He instantly gets melted, right? He doesn't even have a chance to like, try to disengage from that fight. McWin now with the reigning moments, waning moments, I should say, of that QT. He it? utilizes it perfectly oh. to stay alive. And Garrett, that's got to be one of my favorite changes from the offseason heading into Season 3 is the QT now on live fire instead of some of the maps where it just didn't seem to work like on Aqua. No, I think uh, I think it's been a much needed addition to this live fire. I think live fire just 
has so many different play styles now with the camouflage on one side, QT on the other, and then you're wrapping that sniper between both sides, especially in the objective game types. But uh, just, this map has become, uh, I think, a fan favorite. Camo up, and the fight ensues as Chick goes down to one HP, but does a good job to reposition, recollect his shields as he finds one, eventually goes down later to barcode, and Native Gaming have another camo to work with, collect patiently. Picking and choosing his spot, doesn't want to alert the enemy to his location. Now he's a chance to bait and switch here. Instead, trades out with Wudum, but you can afford to trade out now with a five kill lead heading into the 40s. Can Native Gaming tie the series up? Phone needs to slow down just a little bit, make sure this camouflage dissipates before you really start to make your next big play. You can't be second guessing what corner someone's gonna be at. And now they got that information, it's gone. What, you're down four? This is gonna be basically the game right here. Whatever next big engagement happens is probably gonna determine whether foe can come back or not. Yeah, for foe, the key here is to keep it within one possession. Keep it within one team wipe heading into the 40s. That way you can have that one perfect fell they're swoop at the low. end to regain the lead, but it doesn't look like Native Gaming want to give it up, do a good job to trade out. They do go three down, but they maintain that four kill lead. A good job, a good efficient use of their lives from Native Gaming. Have them in the lead heading into the mid 40s. Both still just down a possession, but what? they just playing dangerous games, right? Like they, they, are playing, they were playing close together at that bottom half of the map. Luckily, they're able to get out those trades, and that's really what all they're looking for, right? As long as you trade out, you're fine. But when you play dangerous games, sometimes you're going to get burned, but I think they're going to be able to stave off any sort of push from foe right here. Jimbo just trapped in the tower. They all know where he's at. Oh, never mind. Oh, my God. What a shot to hit, but still down six. Going to be tough to come back. That's uh, a flashy play, but how much substance lies in that no scope as Jimbo eventually goes down shortly after, and now you give it to Barcode. That's not what you want to see if your foe is Barcode takes the face of Chick, looking for the double kill on the pillars, but instead will repulse away the grenade to stay alive. Barcode putting on a performance here as Native Gaming look to take game two and tie up this series. Foe, no lives left to work with. They have to play Elimination Halo, perfect Halo at that, if they want to come back and win it, but they're only down three. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not out of question. Mighty's just somehow able to stay alive, and you're going to see this game slow down. That camo is pure bait at this point. You do not go for that. Look, Native had two players ready. They could have gotten it, <laughs> yeah. but they knew that's that's how we lose the game, is, is one of us goes for camo and instantly dies. You could almost read the body oh, no. language of the players. As they start to filter through the garage door, two players go down to one HP for Native Gaming. Oh, he's like, he's rotating into a player at bottom. Yeah, that's, that's dangerous games being played from foe right there. Players Woo. just getting caught out, but Native, man, they slowed it down. They played their game. They're very confident that they're going to be able to find that pick, but a little, a little nervous when you saw them on that camera. It's like, yeah, we could get it. Like, they had the position. Like, if they would have gone for it, they would have gotten away with it, but doesn't matter they didn't go for it. I thought I thought those players would have died at Big Door. I thought we were seeing the comeback happen. Yeah, I love, I love the discipline. I love the IGL, I would assume, there, maybe from... McWin or APG, you got two legendary veterans on the squad saying, hey, uh, step back a little bit, guys. We don't, we don't need camo. We need the win. And if we bait it and don't go for it, we can take the win as they do just that. Got a little shaky at the end. Jimbo. And imagine if it wasn't a six-skill game at that point. That no-scope really could have spurred a potential comeback. Instead, it was all for not as Barcode picks it up instead and answers with a nice shot of his own. Fantastic back and forth series so far. I feel like we've seen both teams show off their strong suits. We go back to the objective, and that's where I believe it's supposed to be a Strongholds game. I think I think this is going to determine the series. Recharge King, King of the, of the Hill. Hill. What do you think about that, Garrett? Recharge King of the Hill. <laughs> mm. So it's not it's on S7, right? So it's yeah. like it's gonna be that shock rifle. And I, that's where like the shock rifle is so interesting to me because if sometimes it feels like you don't really see it pop up at all. Like during the game, like sometimes you just get into a cycle where it's not putting a lot of work in. And sometimes it's like the most oppressive tool in the game where it's, it is, you cannot move. Mikwin, especially with the shock rifle, I think has just great presence of mind to know where to look. He, he does a great job of, of using his teammates to pull players into his sight line. I I am a very big fan of this next game type. 
on King of the Hill. I think I think this is going to be a one where both teams are going to have opportunities to feast. Yeah, I think of uh, Z Mighty's on the other side for Foe with that shock rifle as a competitor for uh, McWin, but I got to go back to collect tools. If you recall, against Sentinels in the offseason, Native Gaming were down in a TS on recharge and collect <laughs> just flew out to bottom mid towards that camo location, got one shot with the shock rifle, and then 180 turns on Sparty for the double kill, 50-49 win. So keep an eye on Collect as much as McWin for that native gaming roster as it relates to the shock rifle. And what else is there? What else do we have to keep an eye on instead of the shock rifle? We know there's plenty of players that can pop off with it. I actually take it back to that conversation we had about mouse and keyboard earlier, wanting maybe Wootum with the battle rifle. But I'll... I'll say this is probably the one time you don't want Wudum with a power weapon or with an opportunity to have something like the shock rifle because I do feel like the advantage is so much greater on controller. Yeah, that's it's an interesting one, right? It's like how much better is the shock rifle on controller versus it's mouse sticky. and keyboard? It's very sticky on controller. I will say what what I want to see from Wutem, because he has that just such, such, he has this ability to quickly change where he's looking and be very accurate at doing it. I want to see him play a really strong middle position throughout these games, right? Uh, to him, it's not necessarily about getting kills. It's just about getting damage downrange. If you can be a high damage dealer, be in those middle positions like needles and uh, and just keep helping teammates as quickly as possible, I think that's where you're going to see a lot of success for him. I agree. And that seems to be the role that Woodham has taken on here on LAN. Going, coming over across the pond. He's been earning more assist than I used to see him online. Uh, so maybe that's the role that he's finding here on land, being that glue player, that uh, utility role on mouse and keyboard, able to play at any range or distance he wants. Depending on your skill, I'd say obviously close range gets a little bit more difficult, to, uh, especially in the melee encounters maybe. Something to keep an eye on here on recharge. Map gets a little bit more truncated from what we saw on live fire previously, but on another map, Streets, what we saw in game one, probably the one of the most close range maps in the HCS circuit. Foe took that pretty convincingly. Will that be the case here on Recharge? I, I don't think so. I think we're uh, due for a much closer game here. I could go anyway. Ah, gee, yeah. That's the thing about game one is it was very convincing. Like, it, it felt like Native, they, they weren't necessarily not in the game. Like, you know, that round two was like, somewhat back and forth but it felt like it was 80 percent of the time it was just like all foam all time so i think in that vein i think this the key here for native gaming their key to victory their win condition we're not going to go too far into the broadcast before mentioning that native gaming condition win, yeah, native gaming's <laughs> victory variable is so we, to we gotta call it the, we gotta call it the mikowski win condition <laughs> for the rest I'm not of the time. only one that says win condition. You know, you're not the only one it's just <laughs> i think i think you started a trend of saying win condition i like it though it's win condition 77 percent of people cheering on the side of the native gaming this time all right i'll be you know it's, i love the boys over at native oh, I think yeah. they're great they uh Oh. But interesting. So native the people people really jumping back on a native after uh, after that game too. I think that's going to be the key though. <laughs> back to the, the win condition for native gaming. They got to start. I want to see them score first, right? Especially in King of the Hill, you get that first capture. Now you can play the clock. You can play for slays. You can play to earn the next hill. There's just something that comes with going up early in a competitive Halo match that allows you to control the pace, to, to set the pace, to set the tone. And that's what I want to see from Native Gaming, if they're to win this game three, like 77% of the chat think, or won, I think that's going to be their key. Start early, start hot, and get that first cap. I think they're in it if that's the case. If not, I think we see a little bit more of the same in game one, where Foe kind of ran away with it a little bit. Yeah, I'm looking at the rest of the series. I'm like trying to determine... So, Native, I think Native has to win this series, like this game. Um, I agree. Because that game five being on Aquarius, see, that's just, that's feasting for Foe. For, for I think Foe is like one of the best Aquarius teams in the game. I, I think Native, this is, this is almost like do or die for them. I think they have to get this done in four. I, I just, I feel like it's so heavily favored. Uh, the Aquarius game five for foe at the moment. You know, obviously we're on land, anything can happen, but we're playing like a pure statistics game. 
Native Native needs to win this game three. Diet game five. That's what that was. That's what we call a game three when the series is tied one one. And speaking of game five, I agree. You don't want to get to a game five against foe because I, I just we've seen way too much of them on Aqua TS where they just look so dominant. I think for Native Gaming. I think they need a little mini reversal here, and I think it starts, in a sense, with this match here on Recharge, King of the Hill. Got to get off to a hot start, and you got to get the Shock Rifle into the hands of McWin or Collect. Any other keys or win conditions on your mind, Garrett? I, I think it, it's, it's going to come down to closing out hills. I don't think you want to... Um, I think if you're native, you don't want to play this neutral game time. You know you know what I mean when, when I say neutral game time? So often when you play games... You'll come down, it'll be like third hill, it's 1-1 one, one tied, and there's like 45 seconds left on the clock. You don't want to be in that position. You want this to be high scoring if you're native. Get, get Be fast, be objective efficient, like go up early, try just to close this game out on hill captures. I think if you get stuck in that Slayer game, always seen as I, I think Foe just has a little bit more firepower on their side when you're playing these objective game types. We saw in game one where they were just winning in the mid gunfights. All right, here we go. Game three is live and on your screen is Native Gaming win that opening break convincingly, taking down all of Foe. Foe do get a, a pinky toes worth of hill time, but that's fool's gold as Native Gaming earn the team wipe, earn map control, and earn that first bit of real time as they take the lead. What's interesting is about how you set yourself up in this hill, right? You, you really want to try to get a player towards control when you have an opportunity to and almost force the other team to spawn towards A and fight out of A. When you do so, it just feels like it's a little bit easier to just stay in the hill and accumulate time. Jimbo at the back of gold and Native Gaming already about to go up 1-0. They must have hurt us in the uh, during the bathroom break or something because this is exactly the strategy that they needed to utilize to get the early jump on foe. Take the wow, first strike, the first that? swing, but wow, that's a big win there. I think that was uh, Z Mighty. No, that's Chick. Wow. In oh, the hill my. And, oh my goodness, look at that. 99.9% .9 or so on the clock for Native Gaming, but that last 0.1% is going to be the hardest to earn as Foe now have control. Chick, Chick somehow was able to get behind everyone else. Once he was able to do so, he, he just caused absolute mayhem. And now look at the setup that Foe has, right? They have someone Double towards kill. tower. Oh, no. Okay, I was about to say, they had someone towards tower. They had the setup. The problem arises when you let someone get a little bit too far up on the map. Native Gaming able to put someone in that hill, and then it simply just comes down to winning a one-on-one. -on -one. All that early time comes in handy. All right, Native Gaming able to survive the scare and score first and take the early lead in this one. Is Collect goes down, but not before already earning six slays. He's having a high actions per minute match here. It's that's exactly what Native Gaming need, but four go down, and Foe now will have good control of the White Hall. Where's the pressure going to come from, right? This is, wu -Tum's just looking at the center of the map. He's just waiting for information to come. If he doesn't get information from his perimeter players, then suddenly he knows, like, okay, they're going to just jump out in the middle. But they decided all to come from the long haul side, and while wu -Tum, he might be feasting oh! on his first triple. On the ACS kill. stage, Woo! killing spree for Wootum. Look at that, on mouse and keyboard, you get the triple kill so quickly, the game can't even keep up with Wootum. Delayed triple kill metal, but fast action for the likes of Foe and Wootum as they get right back in the mix at 75% on this hill and earning more. And so far, Native just really hasn't had a, a great opportunity at stopping Perfect. this hill. and. Well, it's the two young guys on the side of Foe that have just been causing complete mayhem. Wu Tem and, and Mighty's now have just been dominating on this hill in particular. And with Shock Rifle in the hands of Mighty's, you better not jump up. He's thinking about it. Oh, oh, no. I like this, though, from Native Gaming. It looks like they agree GG's go next to play for Needle Hill. But Foe says GG's go next on a respawn as three go down, collect the last player alive. Mighty's checking his corners for a potential flank spawn, but instead it looks like Native are going to have to restart from the long haul. 
Well, the good thing for Native right here is they had a player in pipe, so they, they have that quick access towards hill. It's not it's not what's gonna break the hill, but what it does is it prevents foe from accumulating too much time, right? You're just gonna be able to pester them over and over again. So even though foe's like technically winning on those battles, they, they weren't able to get any time, and Native easily breaks back through, and now they're going to set themselves up like they want. I think this is a great chance for Native just to get a, a massive chunk of time. Big win. The veteran with the camo in his suit and spawns on the seaside of the map for Foe. McWin setting up a back smack, but it looks like Foe expects McWin's positioning here. Nades go out, but they don't find McWin. Instead, McWin finds the slay. Oh, albeit a little sketchy there on Mighties. Takes him down, trades out though on the elevator as Chick now has the flank control in the backside. As he looks to retain the high ground instead, not gonna jump into the hill. I like this. This is a very patient play here from Chick, recognizing that the numbers are dwindling here. Just gonna look to get some fortune and spawns. Gets a potential remote detonation, but instead the flank comes through from the Mauler side, and it looks like Native Gaming have regained control of this hill, but it's so back and forth, so many lives depleted. Everybody goes down for foe, and now Native Gaming should take control of this hill and the time. Oh, this hill's uh, soaking up a lot of that neutral time, right? There's a lot of jumping out of it and trying to make sure you maintain your spawns. And because of that, whoever wins this hill is just going to have such a huge advantage going into the next couple. It just makes it so that when, it, when you play your Slayer game, when you're up a hill, it just feels a little bit better. You're not going to be as uh, as pressured because of it. And with three going down for Native once again, Foe has the setup, right? One player top gold, one player over at back A, two playing towards the middle of the map. You are going to have to fight through these players in order to get towards this hill. And you're going to have to fight through off your back foot. C spawns here for Native Gaming is they're not going to find a way out. And he know? They're going to find a way back to the respawn screen once again as Foe score two in a row to take a 2-1 lead and despite losing some numbers look to have the early rotation this is a great job here from Woodham just simply staying alive on the long haul he's going to earn some more spawns here potentially but looks like native gaming have the hill they drop on it instead and i believe that camo will be burned so at the end of that hill right barcode flipped into those a spawns he was trying to find that break the, the thing that worked against them though is all his teammates went down so even though he like went and got a big kill over back of A, he gave his team the spawn that didn't necessarily want. And now it's just been chaos because ever since, right? Because now you're just always fighting for spawn control. Finally, Native Gaming has been the one that controls the spawns. You're going to see Foe spawn towards A. They have to fight through Mikwin, and he has a shock rifle primed to hit some heads. This is one of those win conditions that we talked about at the start of this match. Is Mikwin starts off a potential killing spree here. Shock rifle double kill as he drops to the bottom mid location, not before dropping two, and that's gonna give Native Gaming a good stretch of time as they look to get right back in this fight and tied it too. Well, I just love how dynamic Mikwin's being in this situation, right? He had the ace spawn that he wanted. He feasted, got that double kill. But what does he do next, right? He pushes back into A, says, okay, we're gonna split them out towards glass this time, and they're, they're just ready to adapt into those gunfights. Just one more round of slays for Native Gaming. They'll be able to secure it, but Chick, he's not letting them secure any uh, any kill on him. Massive win there for Chick. That's a double kill that almost feels like it counts for four in the sense that you're right, Garrett. Had Chick not secured that double, Native Gaming likely secures that their second hill, ties things up, but instead, Foe have control of the seaside and this hill as we hop on board. The finished Phenom, Woodle. What I like from Utum is he's not getting too caught up on having to get those kills, right? To him, it's just damage downrange. Make sure you just slow them down enough. That way, when they do try to make their push, you're ready to find that kill. One player from Native underneath, and they could be just causing mayhem on these next spawns. Foe needs to find a quick pick. The pace was fast and frenetic to start. Three and a half minutes were on the clock when it became a 2-1 game, but... We're about to see two minutes of regulation get eaten off the clock. This one on the C platform has been a little bit hard, harder to secure for both squads as they both five for it. But Native Gaming go four down. Foe lose two, but maintain control and the numbers advantage. And they're going to flip the map. That chick double kill in the tower. Catalyst turns into two, turns into a two kill lead. Is now Foe are up three to one. Oh, Uchen's feasting. Oh, he knows where they all are. Able to get the wow. double kill. kill. Wu-Tem, this kid's phenomenal. Uh, he, he just really understands where he can and, and can't be. He, he's 
he's never over extending or over challenging into these gunfights he's clean with how he uh with how he's able to get kills and transition into the next thing and you see it uh you should you see it on the scoreboard right 23 kills for him in this game the next closest is six kills under wow gonna take uh Almost a killing frenzy to get back to where Wudum is at as he swords above the rest of the lobby. And how incredible is this, Garrett? Wudum entered the HCS offseason with less than a thousand hours in Halo Infinite. Granted, he was a Splitgate professional, so you know he's got the skills to hang. Splitgate, a very similar Splitgate, game to Halo. Probably the closest game Probably in the closest Halo. game. Yeah, that's right. And that's interesting, too, because we've seen players come from Gears of War. We've seen players come from Call of Duty, but maybe the secret... And the fix for all this was Splitgate all along as Jimbo finds the diamond in the rough. Woodham at 24, 9, and 16, having himself a hell of a series. It's interesting because Splitgate's almost like the, the cracked version of yeah. Halo as well. It's like it's like how how cracked can you be on the game? So it's it's basically the best training weights possible. And we talk about the, the problem for Native right here. It's the neutral time, right? It, exactly. The, the Hill 3 and Hill 4 just took way too much neutral time in the game. So when you lose those, it, it's almost backbreaking because now you have to play just about perfect on these hills. And when the other team knows that, they can play in a style that's just some would call cringe, but others just just called defensive, right? Yeah. They don't have to play for the hill. Absolutely. It's necessarily Slayer for them. And well, Foe, with only five seconds left on the neutral time, they'll just let the clock dissipate. This one is over. And we mentioned it when we saw two minutes get evaporated off of the re off that regulation clock down from three and a half minutes to one and a half minutes. And when it becomes a two hill game there, Garrett, you got to ensure that you have at least two minutes left in regulation. One minute per hill, you know, give or take, is about the time you need to secure a comeback as Native Gaming are not going to get the chance to do that as Foe take a 2-1 series lead. And again, that finished Phenom, that up-and-coming budding superstar Woodham looking for his first victory on land. It's tough, like, for Native, because they were, they were very close to securing those hills. But sometimes it's almost like you prefer to go down 3-0 in a game and have four minutes left on the clock and be able to have a lot more time to work with and to be down 2-1, fighting like fighting to the nail for that third hill and have once you're once you're in that final stage, you see there's a minute left on the clock. You're like, oh no, because then it's like it's not even necessarily like you you lost it because you played worse it, it could just be someone got a better spawn they, they get the kill they they do some some big impactful play remember like what we saw from from uh chick in the tower right this double from mick one was great but chick getting into that back tower right that's just an impact play that he makes you know it's a great play by him i don't necessarily think that's like native's fault that they let that happen uh but once they did, it's just like, okay, that neutral time is going to come back and just kill you in yep. this game. Hey, it's just, I don't think you blame Native for that. I think you just tip the cap to Chick. The new player for Foe, let's talk about Chick a little bit. Uh, coming over from Quadrant, experienced successful history last year. The first EU team to break into that big three, top three, top well, actually, four even. I want to talk about what this real one sec. Look, so there's two minutes and 14 seconds when this hill starts. Right. They had everything. Like, like, look how dominant this position was. But it comes after this, right? So this is when he like opens up, like he went and blocked A after that. He like opened up glass and they eventually lost the hill there. But God, this is such a good setup. Like this is prime halo right here where he's just sitting tower he knows exactly where these guys are going to come from shock rifle out take them down on on your way through just i'm surprised did collect die no. yeah, yes, he, he did, did. that's he the did. big difference yeah. right what so what's what's uh, interesting about gold. this right is if collect yep. stays alive there this is a huge huge setup for native because then you're forcing a back pipe spawn instead when chick dies and collect opens up that spawn I mean, when Chick gets the kill and Collect opens up that spawn, you see the spawners spawn closer towards Chick, towards that tower. It just gives them quicker access. And right, and then, then they don't really feel that resistance right away coming off of spawn from Collect being in that position. It's not as, as oppressive as you think it would be having that setup. Like when you look top down, you're like, yeah, that's a pretty good setup for, for Native, but circumstances for Foe allowed them to be pretty quick on this crackback. Kills aren't enough. It's what you do with it. And there we see Foe. 
with the kill on Collect, regain control of the high ground on gold, and were able to break through because yeah, of it. They're so fast to get towards long haul. And then they got that first pick, and from there, they were just able to, to get Native out of that hill. So I, I think Native, they played the beginning of that really, really well. Like, they, they were setting up to be like, okay, we're going to have like a perfect hill here, even though it's a, a very exposed hill. And then suddenly, just one kill makes all the difference, right? And, and that's why it's so important when you're that perimeter player to understand that you can't just go take a one-on-one -on -one a lot of times, unless, unless you are just aware that you're going to have like a you're going to cause mayhem for your team if you go down and that, that's just what happens when collect loses that one-on-one -on -one right there because it just it opens up a lane for the other team to play through native gaming with a 2-1 lead in this series as we set our sights towards argyle ctf for aim4 and tools i think this sets up for the next conversation for this series as we watch chick with the sniper in his hands chick formerly of quadrant we saw both Quadrant and Foe lose about half of their rosters. Their, the core remains and sustains, but a lot of team changes, a lot of, a lot of chair shuffling in the EU region as Chick goes from Quadrant to Foe. Foe defeating Quadrant throughout the offseason and taking the number one spot in EU, one of the best snipers in HCS, and I am excited to see him here on Argyle. I got to imagine, Garrett, that's their sniper one. That's who you're going to see with the sniper in your hand. Uh, or excuse me, in the hands of the foe roster. You think so? I think so. I, I, I'm, I'm going to take foe. If I had to predict who goes sniper versus sniper, give me a chick for foe and McWin for native gaming. What about you? <sighs> See, this looks interesting. It's like, yeah, mouse and keyboard players, sniper, but I feel like it's all like mouse and keyboard has such an advantage on long range gunfights in particular. I feel like you give Mighty's the sniper. You say, okay, like, put, like, I all you really want from Wutem is damage. Like it's not, it doesn't matter right. about the kills. So it's almost like, I, sometimes I feel like it's almost more valuable for these like really great mouse and keyboard players that are able to put down a lot of damage just to go play mid map and, and get slays. But we'll, we'll see in the kill feed. I'm very curious like who went and got the sniper for both sides. I, I think if you give it to Mighty's, but Mick went on the side of, uh, of Native getting his sniper. All right, Mick win with it for Native Gaming and Still trying to see who's got the snipe for foe. I hear the shots ringing out, but I don't see the feed lining up. Instead, it's McWin finding the finish on Mighties. And I have to, I think it is Chick with the, yeah, it is Chick with the snipe for foe. Interesting start here as we have an early flag out for Native Gaming. Don't quite have the numbers advantage, especially on a map like Argyle. As Barcode goes down shortly after, McWin though, gonna utilize that QT. This is where McQuinn can be really dangerous, right? You, you get him in that mid-map with a sniper QT to, to get himself out of sticky situations quickly. You have to deal with McQuinn ASAP. You see that player on the top? I don't think he knows there's a player in that vent right there. Like, he, I don't think he knows he's crossed yet. Yeah, he oh, he picks up on it, and Quick he picks up him. the slay. Chick goes down, and Foe, though, with a flag out. So that's two times we've seen a flag go out very early in the cycle as there's not many down look a player's coming in from the back side these players from foe staying alive for as long as they have has caused absolute mayhem wu Tem gets up into the center they're going down three all four go down for native those two players cause absolute mayhem by staying alive by the time for foe to get through to the mid map they get four down and that secures a flag capture that might be some of the best halo we've seen yet wu with two triple kills already that we've seen in this series as he spurs foe to a 1-0 lead here on Argyle CTF, but three go down. A lot of resources are used for foe. Native Gaming look for a counter cap, but Collect goes down shortly after. It just shows you the power that you can have if you stay alive in a place where you're not supposed to be, right? All those players from Native had to push backwards to try to deal with them, and just great heads up Halo makes the difference. Native, I think they need to get a little bit tighter in this game. So far, we're seeing them have a lot of space in between each other, and what's been happening is they've been going down a little bit too early tighten yourself up here when you make this push push together i agree garrett the process seems to be just a step or two ahead for native gaming they're playing the process a little too quickly a little too soon a little too ahead of themselves as apg goes down numbers advantage though for native has them in the base of foe once again with another flag out but i love this here the process they get the flag out but they know they need more slays to advance it as they go for that starting to play their process a little bit better but on the other side it's another flag out for foe as mighty's has a run with it yeah i like that jimbo's the one with the sniper i love this jimbo for it oh 
Oh, I'm so sorry, Jimbo. You were saying? That, that's my fault. I'll take the blame. I'm so... No! Oh, sticky from Mighties. As we're starting to see Native Gaming go down uh, a little unfortunately there. And this is huge. I love this. I love this take to the top from Jimbo to utilize the grapple. Such a key equipment and utility to utilize here on Argyle, especially when you're looking to make that quick flag run. I think Jimbo almost got a collat right there on the other side, but you can feel that pressure coming in from the door right here for Jimbo. All it is about staying alive and keeping players accounted for. Unfortunately, APG, he is so good at finding the dead space on the map and getting through it. APG being able to find Jimbo unsuspecting is what activates his whole play and allows Collect to have a relatively easy flag run home. Love that route there from Collect. Recognizing that three went down for Foe, he takes the fast track and exposes himself through mid, but it was the right decision, the right process, most importantly played there from Native Gaming as they utilize the positioning and the strategy to tie this game up at one. Collect with another no scope, long range there. Takes down one, but goes down shortly after and feels like Native Gaming are starting to heat up. And they play, they're playing a really clean game. Oftentimes, what happens is when you capture a flag, because you have to move yourself back towards your base, you give up a lot of space, and then the other team is able to find a counterattack because of it. But no, Native Gaming, they're, they're very clear in how they play. They, they were expecting those pushes. They're able to find those early picks. And you would have expected some sort of counterattack to come through. Nothing happens. Instead, Native Gaming were able to play the neutral game once again. After dueling caps for both sides, both teams now vying for that ever important mid-map control as the battle ensues on the vents. But it's Jimbo instead who goes down, barcode stays alive. No sniper left to work with. He's got to worry about that grenade ticking around the ventilation system. It's almost like a heat-seeking missile. You can hear it haunting him in his dreams, chasing him down, but barcode stays alive for now, hearing more grenades explode around the ventilation system. Everyone, it seems like, for foe knows about barcode's location, but he just won't die. Now he's got the QT. Oh, he has a player that was there. Jimbo took him down. Oh! Double kill. Hi, so that's Jimbo saying, hey, hey, you know what? I You don't say it first, then I can get the shot down. And <laughs> Jimbo, I, I love how everyone on foe has had their chance with the sniper. Right? We've seen Chick with it. We've seen Jimbo with it. It's just next man up at all points of time. They're, they don't necessarily have to play the, the standard game. I love that there. Body shot, headshot cleanup. Headshot double kill on collect as Jimbo looks to take ever important map presence as it looks like with that three down for Native Gaming, Foe have won the mid map and now they're looking to push through. He's, just, he, he's so good at predicting these uh, these next pushes from Native. It feels like every time we've seen Jimbo take a look at a, a specific sight line, that's when a player has been popping up, but this game has just slowed down immensely. Jimbo looking to protect his teammate Mighties. But he's got a 1v1 he's got to worry about himself. As Woodham goes down on the other side, APG and Chick trade out. Nice no-scope again to the body from Jimbo. He's been consistent with that and consistent with the cleanup. Can he earn another one here? No, not for now. But the damage is enough to earn the time, to earn the positioning, to eventually take that player down. Flag gets reset, but this is looking good here for Foe as they have flipped this map on its head and or, or regain uh, numbers control and look to regain control of the map. It's about playing the map in stages, right? That first flag, it's not necessarily about it getting home. All it is is about uh, playing the long con, getting control of this map. And well, it's been fantastic for Foe ever since. They've been just pressuring into this back base. Now this flag that's been pulled out seems to have a much better chance of success. You gotta play this map in thirds, right? You get a flag out, it's not enough. Even with four down, you gotta drop it around the initial point, 33% or so. And now it looks like Foe are gonna run right through. They have enough slays. They have a 2-1 lead and with just 4.45 left on the clock. This feels like a good one here for Foe. Now again, this is what we're talking about all series. They have the lead. And even if it's just by one, it feels like they're in full control of the pace of play oh, no. as we're gonna start to see a little bit of desperation reek here for Native Gaming. Instead, on the other side, it's Mighties with another flag out. Foe looking to end it right here. And that flag just saved his life. Because that flag hit the top of that pole, he didn't go through to the elbow quick enough. And they, they weren't able to take him <laughs> down. Collect goes down. No He's way. still alive. Mighty's still alive. The flag's still out. It's only two players up, but no one can stop him in time. <laughs> They're going down. It's only Mikwin. The flag's away. Mighty's is able to do this. They're just moments away. The first game for Foe can happen.
happen right here, right now. EU on top. Foe, take it. And they take down Native Gaming quickly before they even get a chance to counter and potentially come back and tie it at two. Foe say, no, 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 no. We are here across the pond. We have taken the travel. We're not affected by jet lag as they look good here to start. And this is an important series again, Garrett, in that it's that two, three seed. And talking about the format, you get fourth place, you go home. You don't even mm. get the chance to fight in lower bracket. And with the changes to the format, where two spots aren't guaranteed to MX and ANZ, okay. it's gonna be Double even more kill. competitive there for that fourth and final spot. Triple Folk kill. giving themselves a little bit better chance to start off in the upper bracket side of things and avoid any chance of getting sent home before even starting off a champ bracket. The kid's legit. The kid's legit. 17 years old from Finland. Mouse and keyboard. This is something that's just like has never happened in Halo before. Someone coming in yep. on a different input, young player to, no to come hours in. in the game, first virtually. land performance, he wins his first pool play match. Now, I think they were favored in this pool play match. Sure, sure, sure. Still, I, 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 I was very impressed with how he played. You can't take anything for granted, right? Just because Foe was you know, the likely favorite going into this one, Native Gaming getting, in a, in a sense, gifted their spot in pool play.